group presentation that we're going to be doing in lieu of final exam. So those of you who were here last time got a vote, right? Um, and I was able to give most of you either your first or second choices. Or actually, I was able to give everyone their first or second choices. Um, so those of you who weren't here, I put you into slots where there was space. So here's who's going to be working on what. So when I call your name, raise your hand, look around the room, um, see who your other group members are, right? And then it would be best for you to get together and talk to those people at the end of the class um, and exchange information so you can get started. So you can get started as soon as possible. Right? One of the reasons I give you this assignment so far from the actual exam date is so that you have plenty of time to get this together. Uh, so working on the peach blossom fan will be uh, Casey McWhorter, uh, Melandria Oliver, and Jasmine Brown is the one who usually sits up here, but she's not here today. Uh, working on Gulliver's Travels will be uh, Sarah Arnolds, Allison Beckelheimer, and James Harton. On uh, the Tale of Q, uh, Sarah Sellers, who is usually sitting right there, um, Chris Cox, and Valerie Skipper. On uh, the death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, Macy Underwood, Hunter Heilman, and Kiba Taylor. Working on the good woman of Set Swan, uh, Noah Van Zant, Brittany Mutcherson, and Ashley Campbell, who was also not here, but is usually sitting right in front of the camera. Um, and working on Death and the King's Horsemen, uh, Lindsey Brooks, Jonathan Sayers, and Sidney Biddle. All right, so now you all recognize each other, right? When we adjourn, get together with everybody else and exchange info. Um, if you happen to know your wayward group members who aren't here, try to get in touch with them, get them in the loop too. If not, well, we'll figure out some way. Essentially, like if somebody in the group is not communicating or doesn't seem to know what's going on, come tell me and I'll communicate with them. All right, so here's what I want you to do, right? I want you to come up with a 20 minute presentation, right? Now, 20 minutes here is a hard limit because we have two, we only have two hours in the exam period. So I really need you to stick to 20 minutes, right? The problem I've had with these usually in the past is not so much groups going too short as groups going too long, right? Because they don't want to leave anything out. So the most important thing to learn here is to sort of be selective with the information you share. Only share the information that you regard as most important. Now, as to what I want you to include in the presentation, right? It should include a brief summary of the text, right? What happens? Who are the characters? I want you to give me a brief discussion of the historical and cultural circumstances in which the text was produced, right? So if you're looking at, say, the Peach Blossom fan, right? Tell me a little bit about cultural conditions in 17th century China that would be relevant to this particular play, right? Give me some historical background. Um, I want a literature review detailing the most important things other scholars have written about this text, right? So you are going to have to go and do some research. This is one of the reasons I'm trying to give you a lot of time for this. I want you to do a literary analysis of the text, right? Pick the text apart, pick apart its language, pick apart its imagery, important symbolism, thing, things of that nature. Um, I want a complete bibliography for the whole group, right? So for the whole group, I want just one master bibliography of all the sources that the group consulted. And finally, I do want from each of you a brief write-up detailing and rating each group member's contribution. Um, you're not going to be graded as a group, right? You're going to be graded individually. Now, everyone in the group will get a better grade if the presentation is really good, right? But if I'm grading you individually, right, then if somebody in the group doesn't pull his or her weight, it doesn't drag all of you down. So 
here's what I want as far as the write-up is concerned. All right, um, and this is gonna this is gonna take place. This is gonna be due on Tuesday, the sixth of December. Right, we'll meet from 10:30 to 12:30 in this room on that date. All right. So what you're gonna do for the write-up, you're gonna give me a short paragraph describing in detail what each member of the group did, right? What parts of the presentation was each group member responsible for, including yourself, right? Tell me what you did and rate your own contributions as well. This will help me see if what you say you did matches up with what your group members say you did. And I want you to rate each member of the group, again, including yourself, from one to five, one being low, five being high, across three dimensions, right? First, responsiveness. Did this person respond when you tried to get in touch with him or her, right? You email, you text message, whatever, right? Do they answer you? Do they show up for meetings? When they show up for the meeting, are they prepared to work? Two is collegiality. How easy is this person to work with? How pleasant are they to work with, right? If they disagree with other people in the group, do they do so in a mature fashion or do they throw hissy fits? Right, don't throw hissy fits, right? Adults don't throw hissy fits. Intellectual contribution. How much did this person contribute to the ideas in the presentation? Right. Did this person actually contribute ideas or did they mostly just do what other people told them to do? All right, so any questions about that so far? Any questions about anything so far? Okay, so let's talk then about what I'm looking for in a presentation here, right? Now, when you think of the classes that you really, really dread going to that just bore the ever-loving shit out of you. Um, what are they usually like? What's the most boring possible class setup? Yeah, just sitting there while somebody drones on reading off the PowerPoint, right? So if you don't want to watch that, if you don't want to sit through that, don't subject others to it. I'm not saying that you can't or shouldn't use PowerPoint or Prezi, but if you are going to use them, try to use them just as visual aids, right? Don't write all of your presentation points on the PowerPoint and just read them off, right? Use PowerPoint, use Prezi, things like that to show pictures or to illustrate particular points. Right? That's really what they're designed for. Um, in fact, there is actually some solid research that suggests that the PowerPoint presentation, as usually practiced in business and in academia, actually makes people stupider. Um, and makes people forget information. So don't let that be you. So instead of sort of just going the PowerPoint route, think about like the classes that you actually enjoy going to and what the professors in those classes do to keep you engaged. Right. Do they make a game out of it in some way? Do they you know, question you about what you're reading or what you're talking about? Um, do they do innovative experimental little skits? Whatever, right? Just think about this. You know best what actually keeps you engaged. So when you're putting together your presentation, think hard about that. I've had students do all kinds of different little things in these kinds of presentations. I've had students um, like start with a game of hangman. Um, I've had students uh, do little skits, like they show up uh, for a, <coughs> a presentation on Oedipus uh, dressed in togas. The one guy actually put like blood capsules in his eyes. It was uh, good times. <laughs> um, but yeah, so don't be afraid to be creative when setting up your presentation. Right? As long as you're hitting all of the right points, right, you will be rewarded here for creativity um, rather than sort of sticking to the safe, dull PowerPoint. You're like, oh, I don't want to sit through a PowerPoint either, right? Okay. Um, also, 
it's tempting, I know, to just divide up all of the tasks, right? Like, you do this thing, you do this thing, you do this thing, and then we'll just show up on the day of the presentation and we'll each do our little part, right? There are a couple of problems with that approach, though. One, some of the tasks are a lot easier than others, right? So if somebody's doing the summary and somebody else is going and researching the cultural and historical background, the person who's doing the summary got off really easy, right? It's a lot easier to do a plot summary than it is to do a lot of these other things. So try to make sure that everybody is doing a more or less equal amount of work. Your presentation is also going to be better if you each have a hand in different parts of this so that you can actually speak to each other and kind of nimbly bounce off of one another as you're talking. And it's good if you look like you know what the other people are going to say. So divide up the tasks in a way like that, you know, multiple people are responsible for single tasks and make sure that you've rehearsed this before you come and try to do it, right? One, you'll know then whether or not it's long enough, whether it's too long or too short, right? And you can say, okay, what do we have to add? What do we have to cut? And you'll have this down cold by then, right? You practice it a couple of times, you get together, you rehearse, you get up here in front of everybody, and there's no fear, right? You know what you're going to do, you know what you're going to say, you know what's going to happen. Also, finally, I do want everybody to take the research portion of this very, very seriously. Again, this is why I'm giving you so much time on this assignment so that you can locate sources. If you're having trouble finding sources, come talk to me and I'll see what I can do to help you. But essentially the rules on sources that apply for your paper also apply to the presentations. So no dodgy online sources, no summaries, right? No spark notes, no schmoop.com, no master plots, uh, no popular newspapers or magazines. You're going to be using the same kinds of sources you should be using for your paper. Okay, does anybody have any questions at all? Yeah, Chris. Just one, well, like last year in your class, you know we got the insert video links as long as they're like two minutes or less. Can we do that with this one too or no? Yes, if you're going to use video, uh, restrict it to less than two minutes. Um, particularly those of you who are doing a play, that might actually be a good thing for you to do. Um, but yeah, keep it very, very short, right? Because I want this to be mostly you talking, um, not giving it up to something you found on YouTube. Any other questions? No? We're good? We're clear? Everybody gets it? All right. Well, if you do come up with questions or if you have any difficulties, right, you know where to find me. Come talk to me. All right. So the music that I was playing at the beginning of class. Does anybody recognize this piece? Are any of you familiar with it? Heard it before? Okay, a couple of you are nodding. In what context? What do you know it from? What time of year do you usually hear it? Um, yeah, kind of around now, right? Late October, right? And some of you might be, how many of you have ever seen like the Disney film Fantasia? Okay, and there's the visualization of this, right? Where it's, you know, the, all the ghosts and demons and everything swirling around the mountain. There's the great big devil thing on top of the mountain throwing his arms up and playing with fire and doing all that sort of thing. Now. This particular tune is based on Russian folk melodies and Russian legends about 
witches' Sabbaths that are held on St. John's Eve. So sort of the equivalent, the Russian equivalent of like the German Walpurgisnacht, right? So which we talked about in Faust. Now, why does this matter for what we're talking about today? Well, Masorgsky, if we look at the date here of this composition, 1867, this is roughly contemporary with Dostoevsky's work here, right? This particular novel of Dostoevsky's was published in 1864. And around the time Dostoevsky was writing, there was a group of composers uh, working in Russia. They were known as the Five or the Mighty Handful. Masorgsky was one of them. The group also included Mili Balakirev, Cesar Cui, Alexander Borodin, and Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov. We mentioned him last time when we talked about Baudelaire. He was the guy uh, who heard musical notes as colors. Right, the guy with the synesthesia uh, as a neurological disorder. So these five composers worked in opposition to what they saw as dominant musical trends in Europe at the time. Right? Most European music culture in the mid-19th century was centered around a kind of conservatory culture in Vienna. Right? If you wanted to be a professional composer, or a professional musician, a conductor, whatever, you went to a conservatory and you studied musical form, right? A musical notation, classical music. What the five were instead interested in doing was creating a distinctly Russian music. Right? If you listen to a lot of 19th century orchestral music, it's hard often to distinguish the composer's nationality. Right? It's hard to tell a French composer from a German composer, from an Italian composer, from an Austrian composer, because they're all learning essentially the same methods in the same schools in the same places. So the five are trying to come up with a distinctly Russian version of orchestral music, drawing on Russian traditional music and traditional Russian themes. This is part of a resurgent nationalism in Russia in the mid-19th century. Right, so what they're trying to do, what they're trying to emphasize is the ways in which Russian culture is distinctly different from broader European culture, right? What makes us special? What makes us unique? What makes us different? This is motivated by a couple of factors. Does anybody know anything about the social situation in Russia around the time Dostoevsky was right, how Russian society was set up. How was most of Europe set up in the 19th century? What's, what was the primary economic model of most of 19th century Europe? Socialism, or what is it? And it wasn't socialism. It's not really too different from what the economic setup in most of the West is now, right? It was a form of capitalism, but it was, yeah, primarily industrial capitalism. Right, you had people building factories, filling those factories with workers, mass producing goods for really just about the first time in human history, right? So instead of an individual craftsman, you know, painstakingly working on a watch, you know, putting it together piece by piece, you had a group of workers each making a single piece of that watch 
and then putting it all together at the end and putting it on the market and selling it, right? Because you could make a lot more watches more cheaply and more quickly that way. Now, Russia hadn't really got in on this. Russian society was still essentially feudal and agrarian. Right, so the primary economic activity in Russia was still farming. And most of the farming was done by serfs who were bound to their estates and worked for a landlord who usually spent most of the year off the estate, right? Living in big cities like St. Petersburg or Moscow. So you had really kind of two rushes that didn't have very much contact with each other. They didn't even speak the same language. By and large, the Russian upper classes spoke French among themselves. They almost never spoke Russian to each other. And in part, like this makes sense, right? you're talking about the class of society that is most mobile, that is most likely to go off and visit other places, right? The lower classes spoke Russian, right? Russian was a peasant language, was by and large not really considered fit for literary or artistic expression, right? This was the way low, coarse people spoke to each other. But when Romanticism filters into Russia, right? One of the key side effects of Romanticism is often a strong sense of nationalism that comes in with it, right? often a sort of form of peasant nationalism, right? The, the people of the land, the people of the earth have some special kind of wisdom. There's something inherently good or powerful about them because they're so much more connected to nature. And thus, they are sort of elevated in the eyes of the romanticists. So romantic writers like Alexander Pushkin start writing in Russian at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century as a sort of conscious shot at these French-speaking upper classes. Now, a couple of other things to know about Russia. Um, one, at the time Dostoevsky's writing, we're talking about one of the largest empires on Earth, right? Stretches, you know, from Finland out to Japan. But what's in most of that territory? Mountains, snow, rocks, a lot of people in most of that territory. Spread out. Yeah, the population is extremely spread out, is concentrated in cities, in mostly in the European side of Russia, right? So Russia as an empire was enormous and it was largely empty. And while it was technically ruled by a czar who kind of set the tone for government, most of the actual work of running the country was done by two groups of what would sort of loosely fit into what we call the bourgeois, right? On the one hand, you had an enormous an extremely inefficient army. In particular, you had an enormous and extremely inefficient officer class. Right. Officers running around clanking their sabers freaking everywhere. 
You also had an enormous inefficient civil service bureaucracy. This would be the group that the narrator of Notes from Underground belongs to, right? He's worked in this civil service bureaucracy. So the nation is basically run by army officers and by bureaucrats. And there are too many of both, and none of them are very good at their jobs. So you've got this huge, empty, largely mismanaged empire. And there are essentially two ways to develop of thinking about how Russia went wrong among intellectuals, right? How did we come to this pass? How did we become such a shithole of a country, right? On the one side, you have what are called westernizers. And westernizers argue that, hey, the enlightenment going on in the rest of Europe was a pretty great thing. All of that thinking about human liberty, all of that thinking about freedom, all of that thinking about the place of man in the universe, that was pretty great. And maybe we should bring some of that to Russia. And maybe also some of its attendant democracy. Right? Maybe we should learn more European languages. Maybe we should bring in more European culture. Maybe we should become more like the rest of Europe. And on the other side of this debate were people who were called Slavophiles. And the Slavophiles said that no, where we went wrong was not in missing out on the Enlightenment where we went wrong was straying from our Russian roots and our Russian heritage. Right? So the Slavophiles are often rabidly nationalist. They're in favor of the Russian language and they tended to promote specifically Russian institutions. One, the Tsar and his family, right? Loyalty to the Tsar and his family was very important if you're a Slavophile. Two, the Russian Orthodox Church, right? It was not enough to be a practicing Christian. You had to practice for a Slavophile in the specific, most specifically Russian way possible. And what is this? Orthodoxy, autocracy, and yes, and language. Yep, speak and write in Russian. So it is in this period that Russian is becoming a fit language for literary expression. Partly through the efforts of these Slavophiles who are pushing back against what they see as excessive westernizing influence in Russia. Now, based on what you read for today, I'm not gonna ask where you think Dostoevsky would sit on these issues because Dostoevsky's great talent as a writer is that he is a kind of master ventriloquist and he's really, really good at expressing viewpoints that he doesn't personally agree with sympathetically. Um, where would you think the narrator sits in this debate? Do you think he would sit among the Slavophiles or among the Westernizers? Or neither?
How easy is it to get a read on this narrator at all? I don't say he plays the fence both ways. Okay. Because like most of all the paragraphs in this like first reading, it's like he'll sit there and disagree with something, and like but I don't disagree completely. <laughs> yeah. He tends to uh -huh. contradict himself. Right now. Yeah. He goes back and forth. He vacillates constantly, right? Who's he talking to? Why do you think he's talking to himself? Uh huh. The way he's talking is as if maybe someone is there, but maybe it's like in his head, I guess. Yeah, he keeps referring to these gentlemen, right? But it's hard to tell if he's actually talking to it, like if there is actually another person listening, right? When there is a response, when it's some other voice talking, who writes the response? Who invents the response? Is he actually listening to another person talking? No, yeah, he's anticipating what that other person, what he thinks that other person would say. And what we have here is a, a narrator who is extremely self-conscious. And extremely concerned about how he appears to others. Right, if we look at this first set of sentences on page 635, right, I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am a most unpleasant man. I think my liver is diseased. What do we see in this, what's happening in this chain of short sentences here? I'm a sick man. I'm a spiteful man. I'm a most unpleasant man. I think my liver is diseased. Drunk. What's that? Is he drunk? Hard to say, right? <laughs> well, okay, yeah, the, the liver disease, um, sure, could suggest and, that, right? And, like, when, when I was reading, like, the background mm -hmm. information, they was saying how um, he witnessed, like, that one dude that just got drunk and started be beating um, somebody, mm -hmm. and then he, his dad did the same thing when his mom died. Yeah. To pick on the other people, so I'm guessing he's turning into them. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, he is really concerned with power relationships. That's a yeah. That is a good observation. He's very much interested in how people gain power over others, and what people who have power and what people who lack power do with it. But this very first sentence, right, I'm a sick man, I'm a spiteful man, I'm a most unpleasant man, right, he can't fix a single descriptor to himself. He starts with sick, right, I'm ill, there's something wrong with me. Then, spiteful. What does it mean to be spiteful? You do something on purpose, like, to get some, like, someone's reaction. Yeah, you do nasty things just to get a rise out of people, right? Just because it gives, you, it gives you pleasure to be mean to others, right? I am spiteful because it makes me feel powerful. Then he revises that to, I'm a most unpleasant man, right? He tones the spiteful down a little bit. It's like, okay, maybe I'm not actually malicious. Maybe I'm just difficult to get along with. And then, I think my liver's diseased. What's he moving to there? Why does he say he thinks his liver's diseased at the end of this little chain? What's that supposed to be? Is that supposed to be his way of saying he might not be sick also? Or that's supposed to be an explanation for why he's spiteful? Self-justification, exactly. Yep. I think my liver's diseased, right? I have an excuse. Right? I don't feel well. I think my liver's disease. That's why I'm so unpleasant. That's why I'm so mean. I think my liver's disease. So yeah, he is constantly revising his vision of himself by anticipating how others will respond to him and by anticipating 
and by providing justifications, right, for why he is the way he is or why he thinks the way he does. Now, have we seen before a text in which a first person narrator is constantly offering justifications for things that he did, explanations for his behavior? Does this sound, this sound familiar? Yeah. In fact, he directly references Rousseau here a couple of times. He is drawing this from Rousseau's confessional autobiography tradition. Right? It's a parody of Rousseau in some ways. Right? Now what Rousseau was looking to do was demonstrate that despite his faults, despite his flaws, he was ultimately good, right? He was trying to prove his point about human nature, that people really are good before we're thrown out into society and corrupted. And I'm good underneath it all, right? There's a reason why I did bad things. It was mostly society closing in on me, right? Right? We do bad things because society makes us. Right? Bad society, good Rousseau. But what's different about the cause that the underground man is using to explain his spitefulness here? Did Rousseau blame internal illnesses for his faults? It was always the bad influences of the people around him, right? So, so what that the underground man is blaming his own liver for his faults? Where is he locating the source of his problems? Yeah, it's internal. Everything about this is internal. It's internal monologue, right? There's no one listening. He says at one point that he's aware he doesn't have any readers, right? I, you know, I know that I'm just talking to myself. No one's actually reading this. And the problems that arise within his consciousness are largely, he recognizes, problems of his own making. They're not things that are forced on him by society. But is there something that he's trying to prove? Right? Rousseau had a point. Rousseau had a, a, a particular axe to grind. Is there anything the underground man seems to you to be trying to prove? Does there seem to be any consistent theme in his ramblings? He talks about people, yeah. yeah um, I guess rich people. Okay, give me, can you give me an example? He, he mentions doctors. Okay. <sighs> Men of action. Okay. Let's look for a second at how he describes the way he conducted himself when he was still working, right? He's retired now. How, did he be, how does he say he behaved in his job? Like an asshole. <laughs> yeah, because he could, right? If we look on uh, the next page, 636, right? I've been living this way for some time, about 20 years. I'm 40 now. I used to be in the civil service, but no more. I was a nasty official. I was rude and took pleasure in it. 
After all, since I didn't accept bribes, at least I had to reward myself in some way. That's a poor joke, but I won't cross it out. I wrote it thinking that it would be very witty, but now, having realized that I merely wanted to show off disgracefully, I'll make a point of not crossing it out. So even his, even his leaving his terrible joke in there is spiteful, right? It's like, eh, I thought you would like this, but now I see that you probably won't, but you know what? The hell with you. I'm going to leave it in there anyway. And you're stuck with it. When petitioners used to approach my desk for information, I'd gnash my teeth and feel unending pleasure if I succeeded in causing someone distress. I almost always succeeded. For the most part, they were all timid people, naturally since they were petitioners. So how was he trying to present himself in his job? So he, <clears throat> mean, spiteful, right? These people are coming up to his desk because they need something from him, right? And rather than politely and cordially giving it to them, he makes them twist and writhe and turn, right? He makes them suffer because he can. It reminds so, me of like, these people that work at the DMV office when you need something simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, you, right, you, you, right, you, you make it finally to the end of that line and then they put up the sign that says lunch break. <laughs> yep. Because they can. Is that a power thing? Yeah, it is absolutely a power thing, right? He is trying to demonstrate that he has power over all of these timid souls, right? All of these poor petitioners. I mean, yeah, I have to, you know, essentially I have to fill the requests, but I can do it on my own time in my own way and make them suffer while I do. Right? Civil service hasn't changed much. But among the dandies, there was a certain officer whom I particularly couldn't bear. He simply refused to be humble, and he clanged his saber in a loathsome manner. I waged war with him over that saber for about a year and a half. At last, I prevailed. He stopped clanging. So why does he resent this officer? Hmm? Yeah. The officer, does the officer put up with the underground man's bullshit? No. He fights back, right? He clangs his saber in a most annoying manner. Right, now the saber is on the one hand a symbol of the officer's class status. Right? He can carry a saber. Like, ordinary people wouldn't have been allowed to walk around the street carrying a saber. You can only do that if you're an army officer. Yeah, Brittany. What is this? Oh, it's a sword. Okay. Yeah. And it would be um, for a military officer in the 19th century, not only um, a practical <laughs> weapon, but also a mark of rank. So he's clanging <laughs> the mark of his social rank around. Mm -hmm. And if he refuses to be intimidated by the underground man, how does this affect the underground man's image of himself? He feels less powerful. Yeah, it reduces his feeling of power, right? This is someone over whom he has no power. To this particular narrator, excuse me, other people are basically mirrors. Right. He tends to view other people only as they reflect back his own qualities to him, right? And what this officer is showing him that he doesn't like is his own relative powerlessness, right? This is someone whom I can't get one over on. So when he finally says, right, at last I prevailed, he stopped clanging. Right. This is immensely satisfying. Right. This guy refused to acknowledge my power, refused to acknowledge my authority, and I got him to stop. Good for me. I am that impressive. I was lying just now about myself. 
when I said that I was a nasty official. I lied out of spite. I was merely having some fun at both the expense of the petitioners and that officer, but I could never really become spiteful. At all times, I was aware of a great many elements in me that were just the opposite of that. I felt how they swarmed inside me, these contradictory elements. I knew that they had been swarming inside me my whole life and were begging to be let out, but I wouldn't let them out. I wouldn't. I deliberately wouldn't let them out. They tormented me to the point of shame. They drove me to convulsions and... And finally, I got fed up with them. Oh, how fed up. Perhaps it seems to you, gentlemen, that I'm repenting about something, that I'm asking your forgiveness for something. I'm sure that's how it seems to you. But really, I can assure you, I don't care if that's how it seems. So he starts by stepping back on his claims of the previous paragraph, right, about being a nasty official, right? I was lying about that. I could never really be nasty. And he also reveals in this paragraph some of the roots of his little problem here, right? If we think about how Romanticism viewed the individual, right? what was the status of the individual, the individual consciousness in Romanticism? Pardon? Yeah, the, the individual is great, right? Long live the individual. Celebrate the individual. Celebrate that which makes you unique. And if you're a bureaucrat in the civil service, how easy is it for you to express your individuality? Zero. Yeah, like maybe you can put up a Peanuts cartoon on your cubicle or something, right? But uh, that's going to be about it. The expectation is conformity. All right, everybody wears the uniform. Everybody does more or less the same work. So the nature of his job frustrates his sense of individuality. Right, he can feel all of these things in him, all of these positive feelings struggling to get out. Right? At other points in his diatribe here, he talks about his feelings of the beautiful and the sublime. But because he can't get these things out, his life offers him no outlet for expressing these feelings, these ideas, this romanticism turns sour inside of him, right? And then manifests itself as spite. Now the other thing to note about romanticism, what kinds of individuals do we usually see as the heroes of romantic texts, right? If we look, for example, at Faust, like, is Faust supposed to be just any university professor, just like any old ordinary scholar? He was like the most knowledgeable man on earth. Yeah, he's the best, right? He's the top of his profession. Romantic heroes are usually exceptional people, right? Now he's like, um, how ordinary human consciousness would be more than sufficient. Uh-huh. And how he wish he was like a normal person. But he needs yeah. to Yeah, he, he is convinced that he is one of these exceptional people, right? One of these great romantic heroes that just hasn't had a chance to spread his wings and fly. His job, his associates, everything, even his foul-smelling peasant woman servant, it all holds him back, it all keeps him down. Now, when he gets into philosophizing a little bit later on, Right. He's talking about particular trends in European philosophy that were making their way around in the mid-19th century. Right. He talks a lot about the building of the Crystal Palace.
right? And by the Crystal Palace, what he means is this kind of utopian space where all of, human, uh, all of humanity's problems are solved. Right, this kind of fantasy space where it's like, okay, we've adopted one of these philosophical systems, one of these economic systems that's supposed to fix everything for us, that's supposed to take care of everything. So now we all live in the Crystal Palace and everything's great. So he goes after, at various points, utilitarianism, he goes after science, he goes after nascent communism. Let's look at one of these passages. If we look on page 645, segment 7 here. These are all golden dreams. Oh, tell me who was first to announce, first to proclaim, that man does nasty things simply because he doesn't know his own true interest. And if he were to be enlightened, if his eyes were to be open to his true normal interests, he would stop doing nasty things at once and would immediately become good and noble because, being so enlightened and understanding his real advantage, he would realize that his own advantage really did lie in the good and that it's well known that there's not a single man capable of acting knowingly against his own interest. Consequently, he would, so to speak, begin to do good out of necessity. So what view of human nature is being expressed here? What, if we could sort of sum up this particular philosophy in a sentence, right? What is, what, what, what's the argument being made? It's not really about sin. It's not a religious argument. What can't people do? Well, if you know what your own best interest is, right? Socially, economically, whatever, yeah, you can't act against it. That's the argument being, pro being proposed here, right? If you know what's in your own best interest, if you know what's actually going to make your life better, you can't possibly act against that. So essentially, it's arguing for extreme rationality, that human beings are motivated by logic. That once we know what's best for us, we automatically want what's best for us because that would only be reasonable. Oh, the child. Oh, the pure, innocent babe. Well, in the first place, when was it during all these millennia that man has ever acted only in his own self-interest? What does one do with the millions of facts bearing witness to the one fact that people knowingly, that is, possessing full knowledge of their own true interests, have relegated them to the background and have rushed down a different path, that of risk and chance, compelled by no one and nothing, but merely as if they didn't want to follow the beaten track, and so they stubbornly, willfully forged another way, a difficult and absurd one, searching for it almost in the darkness. Why, then, this means that stubbornness and willfulness were really more pleasing to them than any kind of advantage. So what is the underground man arguing actually motivates people? Does he, see, does he think people are logical or rational? Irrational. Yeah, the people are in fact irrational. And even knowing what their own best interest is will act against it because they want to. That human desire is not something that can be subjected to mathematical formulas, right? The father of this particular school of philosophy, Jeremy Bentham, I think we talked a little bit last time when we discussed Baudelaire, right? Did we mention Bentham and utilitarianism? Maybe, anybody remember? No one does. Pardon? We um, mentioned utilitarianism. 
Okay, and what's the basic tenet of utilitarianism? Ideas are judged by like how useful they are. Yeah, that ideas are judged by how useful they are, and that human beings do always act in their own best interest, right? They're motivated by desire for reward, desire for pleasure, and aversion to pain. So Bentham actually came up with a, math a, a mathematical formula that he called the hedonic calculus that was meant to measure accurately and mathematically the amount of pleasure any given activity would result in, balanced against the amount of pain that would result from it. Right? So an actual mathematical formula for friggin' enjoyment. If you can tell, I don't, uh, I don't find Bentham's uh, philosophy personally congenial either. Um, so yeah, what the underground man is arguing against is this attempt to mathematicize human desire, to think that you can predict what humans are going to do based solely on what it would be rational for them to do. Right, because what utilitarianism ultimately leads to is a kind of determinism. Right, basically, all of your actions are already laid out for you by a chart. You didn't really choose the path that you walk. It was dictated for you by logic. Now, opposed to this, if we look on page 648, for man is stupid, bottom of the page, phenomenally stupid. That is, Although he's not really stupid at all, he's really so ungrateful that it's hard to find another being quite like him. Why I, for example, wouldn't be surprised in the least if suddenly, for no reason at all, in the midst of this future universal rationalism, some gentleman with an offensive, rather a retrograde and derisive expression on his face were to stand up, put his hands on his hips, and declare to us all, how about a gentleman? What if we knock over all this rationalism with one swift kick for the sole purpose of sending all these logarithms to hell so that once again we can live according to our own stupid will? So what is it that people really want according to this guy? Do they actually want to live in a perfect system? Because what does that perfect system rob you of? Yeah, your own stupid will, right? I don't care if what I want is dumb. I don't care if what I want is destructive to myself and others, right? I want what it is I want. Right? Desire is not subject to math. What we all want deep down is just to have our own way. But how seriously can we take the underground man's uh, philosophy as philosophizing? How well do you think he understands human nature? Can we relate this to how he sees himself in relation to others? I feel like he was a pretty good grasp on human nature. Like, he, like earlier, how we said he played both sides of the field, he's seen both sides of human nature, and he was a pretty good like, medium to go to mm -hmm. between them. Is this anybody who has ever actually had his own stupid will? And one thing we'll note, like this first part of the novel, the part we read for today, 
is essentially theory. Right? This is where he's spelling out how he thinks life, the universe, and everything works. Part two is practice. Right? He will demonstrate what real world experiences led him to these theories and how these theories actually worked out practically when he was still out in the world dealing with other people. Right? We sort of get the impression that he doesn't really have a social life now. Right? That the only person he deals with is the foul smelling peasant woman. But Where was I going to go with this? Train, train, of thought, train of thought temporarily derailed. Um, OK. So his own stupid will. All right, one thing um, I want to draw your attention to, just one last thing before we give this a rest until next time. Right, you know, there are the bits where he talks about Cleopatra sticking the gold pins into her slave girls just for the pleasure and the power of doing so, and his own pleasure in a toothache. Right. Can somebody else find the toothache passage? Because I seem to have lost it. 642, great, thanks Chris. All right, 642, ha ha ha, well you'll be finding enjoyment in a toothache, a toothache next, you cry out with a laugh. Well, what of it? There is some enjoyment even in a toothache, I reply. I've had a toothache for a whole month. I know what's what. In this instance, of course, people don't rage in silence, they moan. But these moans are insincere, they're malicious, and malice is the whole point. These moans express the sufferer's enjoyment. If he didn't enjoy it, he would never have begun to moan. This is a good example, gentlemen, and I'll develop it. In the first place, these moans express all the aimlessness of the pain which consciousness finds so humiliating, the whole system of natural laws about which you don't really give a damn, but as a result of which you're suffering nonetheless, while nature isn't. They express the consciousness that while there's no real enemy to be identified, the pain exists nonetheless, the awareness that, in spite of all possible Wagenheims, you're still a complete slave to your teeth, that if someone so wishes, your teeth will stop aching, but if he doesn't so wish, they'll go on aching for three more months. And finally, that if you still disagree and protest, all that's left to do for consolation is flagellate yourself or beat your fist against the wall as hard as you can, and absolutely nothing else. So the moans serve what purpose? Why do you moan when you have a toothache? You moan because of the pain, right? But does the moaning actually help the pain in any way? It makes it more bearable. Yeah, and what makes, what about your moaning makes the pain more bearable? What are you doing if you're moaning loudly? You're ignoring the pain. You're not ignoring, you're, not, you're, you're wallowing in it, you're reveling in it. You're not ignoring, what were you saying, Melandria? Uh, yeah, you're upsetting other people around you, right? You're inflicting some portion of your suffering on other people who can't do anything about it, right? Nature, which you can't do anything about, is causing your tooth to hurt. And so you exert your power in the only way you can. You moan to piss off your family and your neighbors. Right? This is how this guy thinks power relationships work, right? I'm suffering. I have no real target for myself. There's nothing, there's no one to blame here. There's nothing on which I can get revenge. So I'm simply going to direct my malice outward to some defenseless target. Because it has to go somewhere. So he is, uh, yeah, uh, you look like you're about to say something. Okay, go for it. I don't know what he's doing with the liver. Where he's like, because he said he was trying to spite the doctors because he knew. Uh huh. It's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know what he's doing with the liver. Like, he's like, I'm going to 
Yeah, I mean, how, how the hell does not going to the doctor when your liver is sick actually spite the doctors, right? Yeah, but he, he's both a sadist and a masochist, right? Yeah. Right, a sadist gives, a sadist gets off from inflicting pain. A, masoch, a masochist gets off from receiving pain. This guy enjoys both, right? The pain he receives, he enjoys reflecting back out onto others. And the pain that he's talking about, and he's gonna be talking about in part two, is not by and large physical pain, right? We're not talking about some sort of weird, uh, you know, sort of physical, uh, you know, kinky, sexy trip thing here, right? No, this is <laughs> mostly about for him humiliation, right? What we're going to see in part two is the constant series of humiliations that he willingly subjects himself to in order to be able to reflect some part of his suffering on innocent victims like his readers. Bet you can't wait. <laughs> All right, so I think that's actually probably a good place to stop for today. Um, so I have some reading questions for you. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Finish this up. <laughs>